Welcome to Six Picks Music Club, a music podcast for people who recently got into jazz. Hey, you're listening to Six Picks Music Club. I'm Dave, and with me are Jeffro and Russ, and we're your hosts for the music podcast where we pick six songs around the topic we pick for the week. And uh, we really appreciate you being part of the show and uh, making Six Picks Music Club the first listen that you listen to today. The best way you can help us grow the pod is to listen every other week on any podcast platform, leave a five-star review, or like the video on YouTube, comment anything below. All right, let's go. What's up, guys? Fro, Russ, how we doing? Doing well, man. Doing well. Yeah, yeah, good. I'm wearing a cutoff hoodie. Ooh, are you like training for a boxing match? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> good. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like I feel like Rocky Balboa is the one who I, how I see sport that look. So, I mean, you have a similar physique, I think. Yeah, I'm going to have to take Wegovi for six <laughs> months before I can qualify for a weight class, but sure. You got a GLP-1 action happening for you? No, that's good. Hey, is uh, Wagovi a, a pod sponsor yet? Have we got them on board? We're working on it. I've had a couple okay. calls in there, a couple of emails exchanged, but uh, we're still finalizing some details there. So hopefully, uh, maybe next step, we'll have, have more details on that. I have some copy ideas for them if, uh, if we ever decide to do that. Oh, so. yeah. Well, let it rip. Let's hear it. What do you got? One of them is um, Wagovi, lose some weight. Fuck your thyroid. <laughs> Is that pretty good? Yeah, That's yeah, pretty yeah. pretty good, man. Nice, nice. <laughs> How about uh, Wigovi? You'll look better, but your heart will explode. <laughs> How about Wigovi? Better than Wigravy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love a good chicken fried steak with some cream wood gravy on it. It's just yeah, mashed potatoes. So white wood gravy. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm on the Wagovi, so I can't have the gravy anymore. It's just kind of trying to limit, increase the uh, activity and limit the wood gravy for sure. No, that's great. Yeah, hopefully uh, they'll get back to us on, I'll send them those notes and we'll see what they say. Yeah, sure. Their, uh, their marketing department will be keen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they're always looking for a way to get into uh, new markets and really uh, generate some buzz with the kids. So uh, I think we got a fair chance. Yeah. Well, before we get going, uh, like every week, we've got to get a password to uh, open up the clubhouse doors. Uh, what do we got for the password this week, boys? It's a capital S, so yes, so fresh and double P, D O double G Y D O double G, you see. Okay, little Snoop Doggy Dog gonna get us in the room today. Yeah, there it goes. Doors open. Come on, everybody, pile in. All right, yeah, very nice. Let's all get in there. Don't drag ass, listener. Come on, find your spot. Well, so as the title of today's ep might indicate, and being that today is the celebrated holiday, our topic tonight is about celebrating African American music through six of its celebrated genres. Uh, but before we get into what we've picked for each other to listen to, the professor's going to give us a little schooling on Juneteenth. Jeffro, teach, my brother, teach. Yeah, I mean, it's not like I'm not going to sit here and lecture everybody, but I'm just curious, how old were you when you found out about Juneteenth, the holiday? Uh, well, it was like federally recognized as a holiday on 2021. Is that right? Yep. I think I had heard of it prior to that, but uh, I didn't really have an understanding of what it was. Really, I think I am in the exact same boat. Well, being that we live in Texas, they don't really like to talk about it. It's interesting that you bring that up, Russ, because do you know that the origins of Juneteenth is Texas? Yeah. Yes. No, I do know that. For a listener, in case a listener doesn't know, why don't you tell me? The idea behind Juneteenth is that it celebrates the emancipation of slaves. But the first question that it might raise is why is that not celebrated on January 1st? Because the Emancipation Proclamation was on January 1st, 1863. It takes longer for information to travel, the horses and stuff. It takes information two and a half years to travel in the 1860s. <laughs> oh, so two and a half years later they found out? What it is is that the Emancipation Proclamation happens during the Civil War. It couldn't possibly be that the Southern 
slaves would be freed until after the war had resolved. So the Emancipation Proclamation was announced. Then the 13th Amendment uh, came around, which prevents involuntary servitude. That's the initiation of what we call the second founding, which is there was the Declaration of Independence and the first Constitution. Of course, that is in some ways a racist founding. There were slaves that lived in our country and they were counted as three fifths of people based on the three fifths compromise. And so after the Civil War, there were amendments 13 through 15, which were considered the second founding. Amendment 13 prevents involuntary servitude a.k.a. slavery. It's the amendment form of the Emancipation Proclamation. And then what happens is they go to Galveston, Texas, right after the end of the war, and they announce to Texas slaves that they've been freed. And that happened on June 19th, 1865. So that's when Southern slaves became freed, and it started in Texas. Got it. And so that's why it's kind of a Southern black holiday and not a national black holiday, even though people around the country know about Juneteenth. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like Kevin Costner is riding his postman horse all across the country to deliver the news and it took him two and a half years to get to Galveston? No. Uh, again, it took a while to win the war. And then after the war was over with, they announced it to the... It's not about the speed with which information travels. Oh, uh, when did the war end? In 1865. Got it. So if we're talking timeline, you know, the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, which is when uh, Robert E. Lee surrendered to Grant, is in April 1865. Okay. The uh, announcement of the emancipation in Texas is June 19th, 1865. Were they the last ones to hear? Dude, so I just, I did a little fact check of myself. It claims that people didn't, in Texas, didn't find out about the Emancipation Proclamation until that date, like you suggested. I find that very difficult to believe. It could be that it was kept away from the enslaved populations, and it wouldn't be until after the war was over that news would reach them, because it was controlled by the Confederacy, and it was kind of the Wild West out there. But I'm sure news of the Emancipation Proclamation had percolated and trickled down, at least, into parts of Texas. I, j I just can't imagine that people weren't reading newspapers that said that it had happened. I'm sure the, the owners, the slave right. owners, knew, right? But they were going to squeeze every last, every last ounce of— Like, what if we just don't tell them? Yeah, maybe? Right. I mean, that's exactly what happened, I bet. Yeah. I suppose that that's the story. The information was just— systematically kept from the enslaved population, which, you know, I mean, that does make sense in a dark way. I was probably like a late teenager when I first found out about Juneteenth, because even though I'm from Louisiana, it it wasn't like something that we celebrated. It, and I, I knew the word Juneteenth, but I didn't really know what it was about. And it wasn't until I lived in New Orleans that it really became like so, something that my family celebrates and my it happens that my firstborn boy was born on Juneteenth which makes it even cooler cuz we would go nice. to like Juneteenth celebrations you would wear it's my birthday shirt and then it's like we're just part of the big fun party but it's such a great holiday man nice. it's like cookouts and it's, it's a lot of we feeling and goodness on Juneteenth it's a special thing i love it i came to know of it much later. I think I was late 20s, early 30s, probably before I understood what it was and, and what it was about. And uh, as Americanized uh, Cinco de Mayo, which is a, a weird holiday that uh, Americans celebrate that uh, uh, isn't exactly uh, what the Hispanic people celebrate it for. But um, do, do Americans celebrate that or just Texans. Oh gosh, that's a good question. And stays along the Mexican border. Yeah, yeah. You were in the valley, so I'm sure that was like a, a piece of of that. The valley is like a bordering the southern border of the U.S. and Mexico. Well, like I, I'm a little bit f farther from the border, so we didn't get school off. But the people, like my family in Brownsville, they always got it off. Like it was a party. 
Yeah, uh, to our new listener up in Illinois, uh, shoot us a message uh, at the email and, and let us know. Do you all celebrate Cinco de Mayo up in Illinois? <laughs> What we're here to celebrate is African-American music and the culture that came up with our fellow Americans who endured that experience. So we we took a couple of different genres from the Smithsonian's site on African-American music appreciation, and and we're going to get into it. But we are going to go with a kind of a unique order today, since we are kind of covering some historical ground where we're going to go chronologically today. So uh, I have the first pick because I have the oldest song and the song that I, I pulled from the genre of jazz music, like our announcer said in the opening, it hasn't been a recent thing, but I, I have gotten into uh, jazz music in the last, gosh, 11, 12 years now. Do you say jazz music every time? <laughs> Well, I, as we're introducing it now, I did, but I'll just I'll just say jazz from henceforth. He said it twice. That's jazz. Jazz, <laughs> okay. jazz music. Look at my jazz music fingers. I was those are jazz hands, man. You you have to be specific. Are we talking jazz hands, jazz dance, jazz music? There's different types of jazz, and even within jazz music, there's like vocal jazz. There's you know instrumental jazz. There's I heard a guy that I work with say like say just he was talking to somebody about giving a talk about speaking and he was like you know uh start off with the major points in the middle do some jazz and i was like i love that i'm gonna i'm gonna take that and say it all the time now and i have routinely said it i'm gonna do some jazz now (laughs) i was just passing that on to other people they're like how do you just stay so confident when you're talking in front of people it's like you know you just want to hit your main points and do a little jazz in the middle you know and they're like (laughs) Cool. <laughs> it's just a, a cool thing to say that I directly stole from somebody else. I think, I think. By the way, I think ninety percent of my material is just straight lifted off of other people. Like you know, it's just things stick in my head from things yeah. that other people have said, and then I, sure. I go like, I like that thing. I'm gonna take that and say it again. Yeah, it's like the Beatles have already written every song. No, I, I, I hear you. It's kind of like white people kept hearing black people's music and saying i like that i'll just reproduce it and make a ton of money off of it and never give it back to the original artist like that i'm gonna take blues music and turn it into country music (laughs) (laughs) or i'm gonna turn it into led zeppelin music i'm gonna turn it into led zeppelin and (laughs) never pay royalties to the original writers of the songs yeah so starting chronologically in 1957, this record came out. It was this artist's first album in a new record deal with Columbia Records, a uh, major label that would provide him with this much wider platform. And that artist is Miles Davis. And this track is Round Midnight off of the Roundabout Midnight album. <laughs> We're back. We're back. You know, you might ask, Dave, like, why would you pick such a sleepy song to start off such an exuberant episode? And, uh, well, guys, I'll tell you, there's a lot of different options in the jazz catalog. I mean, it's a giant catalog with lots of different styles of music and uh, and lots of different things. But this particular record, as I started to say uh, in the intro, is, is first on Columbia Records. It's this much wider distribution uh, it's the first great quintet uh, record that Miles Davis does, and that's uh, with uh, Coltrane on sax, uh, Red Garland on piano, Ch- Paul Chambers on bass, and Philly Joe Jones on drums. And uh, one of the things that sort of highlights this era, which is considered like the birth of cool period of, of Miles Davis's era, is this sort of interplay and improvisational skills that uh, are a major highlight of the album. So title track is this track, Round Midnight, and it's this haunting ballad. It was composed by Thelonious Monk, and uh, Miles' muted trumpet melody is the uh, the real driver. I think there's like a real intimacy and kind of longing about the track. You know, you could say that's great and all that, but like, why, why, why would you pick this track? The other bit that why this is an important record to me is this is a, the first jazz record that I, I bought for myself, and I bought it on April 20th in 2013. At Wax Tracks in Denver, off the corner of North Washington, East 13th Ave, uh, on 420. It was record store day. So they reissued this record on a high weight, 180 gram 
vinyl pressed at RTI and Record Store Day is a global holiday that I've uh, celebrated for for many years. It was also the weekend of my grandfather's funeral and uh, he was a music lover. He had a, a pretty big love for jazz music and so he was always someone that I looked up to in my life. I was down, you know, I left the house that morning because, well, it was like in the afternoon, I guess, because we did other things and then service and came back and I was like, I, you know, it's Record Store Day. I'm just going to pop down to the record store and see see what's left and and this was on the shelf and I thought what better record could I get in this in this moment on this day where we're celebrating the life of my grandfather and uh you know a man who raised seven kids on his own and taught me how to ski you know it's like this this moment that that felt significant to me and so this record was on the shelf and I picked it up and I was like yeah okay I don't really listen to this type of music I don't really listen to jazz but I'm going to get this as a sort of a memory of of this moment and this weekend and and celebrate his life and such. I probably wouldn't have bought the record if it hadn't been the weekend that coincided with that with that life event for me. Okay, so 11 years you've had this record. How many times would you say you've listened to it? Well, so it was like again like the first jazz record that I ever had, so I I've probably listened to it more than any other uh jazz record that's in my collection. So yeah, I've probably played this record I don't know, 50 times. Nice. I feel like you concocted this whole story about your grandpa just so I couldn't make fun of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm struggling over here. I had, I felt like I had some jokes on deck, <laughs> you know, then, and then Dave, Dave yeah. heard the reaction when I talked about my dad passing away and he was like, oh, I like that. Uh-huh. I like, I like the way we all got, yeah, we all got somber for a minute and emotional. I think the thing that's like interesting about this record in particular is sort of the the number of improvisations that happen through this. Like uh, as you get further into this record, there's more of that interplay between the the band and um, there's just some really, really good music. So I, I kind of love it. There's a number of modern musicians that are using jazz influences and, and t- time signatures and, and uh, that type of stuff, progressions. The uh the band that plays us onto the pod, Shaolin Death Squad, is a jazz metal band. That's right. That's right. All right. So that's the uh the earliest song on our playlist today is Miles Davis from 1957. Coming up next in our uh in our historic chronological presentation, we have Professor Frodo with with his pick. Which one are you doing today, sir? Stop calling me Professor, god damn it. Jesus Christ. No, it's cool. It's fine. Hi, everyone. I felt like that was a long segment, right? (laughs) (laughs) Hey, it's me, Jeff, here to bring you the second song on the playlist. Yeah, what did you pick today, man? uh, What's going on? Uh, What's your genre? Yeah, I guess I haven't haven't revealed it to you. So my song's from 1969. My genre is funk. And you're like, isn't that a little early for funk? Isn't funk 70s? So I'm bringing you something that I consider to be proto-funk. Even though James Brown claims to have invented funk and he might be right, and Bootsy Collins is the the maven, the the OG of funk, um, with the one and the way that he thumped his bass, you can't write off Sly and the Family Stone. So we're playing off of their nineteen sixty nine record Stand, the song Stand. Stand is about black uplift, which I think it's a it's a great message coming in 1969. You know, this is a tough time. There are riots on the streets. There are a lot of people that are feeling down. Uh, the Vietnam War is going on. It's a very positive message with stand. And it's like stand up for the truth. Stand up against the giants that you're next to. You know, I think a lot of people would consider this to be a rock song. And if you like look up what genre people consider Sly Stone to be. It's a Sly Stone who was born in Denton, Texas, where we went to university, yep. Dave. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's still alive, even though he, I think, did acid for like 55 years. Uh, Straight. So, uh, it's a remarkable survival story on old Sly Stone. <laughs> he's 81 years old now. But yeah, this this is, you know, a lot of it's rock, but towards the end, we have definitely a funk breakdown. Um, And I think 
I think that is in some ways like melding together different genres that were happening at the time. So you have like acid, psychedelic soul, rock, and funk all blended together. And that's why everybody loves Sly Stone because he could do it all and the songs themselves just kick ass. And so there's not like, he doesn't have to stay like firmly situated in one genre um, so yeah, I think the, he's a funk progenitor, you know, funk really took off in the seventies. And I thought about selecting some more obvious picks like parliament or, you know, who's great and obviously inspired early nineties hip hop or the Isley brothers fight the power. Um, but in the end I went with old Sly Stone cause, uh, I listened to this record when I was in high school probably 400 times. There was something about it. I felt like I was reliving the late 60s. Like I was in the in the middle of it. I love the melodies. I like the backup nice. singers on it. It's just it just and it feels like they're your buddies. Like the family stone, you know, they're they're good people here. Uh, I think that really brought the funk in 71 on There's a Riot going on. If you want to be a purist about the genres, like that's where you're getting your sly funk from. This is a tweener album that's going between like Hendrix and funk music. And so uh, enjoy those of you who don't know Sly and the Family Stone all that well. This segues into hip hop because hip hop drew very heavily on funk for beats and for uh, samples. And the the band that I'm following with directly references Sly and the Family Stone in the song of theirs that's my favorite called Give It Up. The song we'll be hearing is Fight the Power by Public Enemy off of their 1990 record Fear of a Black Planet. <laughs> Public Enemy or Chuck D, born Carlton Ridenauer. What a name. And Flava hmm. Flav. Flava Flav. And of course, DJ Lord back there scratching. Dude, there's, I think a public enemy is like a, as another group that's, it's, they're like a way station between two different eras. You know, you had like the original okay. hip hop, which is Sugar Hill Gang and things like that. And then you have gangster rap, as people ended up calling it after this. And public enemy is, is moving us in that direction kind of like the pixies were moving us in the direction of alternative rock in the nineties, but they were like way out ahead of it. I think public enemy yeah. was doing the same thing and they were aggressive. They had a cool logo that has a crosshairs on it. You know, they're saying, uh, you know, we're going to fight the power. Right. And it's punk. It's like, and Chuck D has said himself, that he was inspired by the clash and some of the punk, you know, bravery of just going after whoever needs to get it. The establishment. The establishment yeah. and everybody else. You can tell it because he's taking pot shots at people in that song. <laughs> Fucking Elvis. Uh, like Elvis <laughs> Presley. Yep. You know, so, right. so awesome. Like if you want to pick a fight with people, <laughs> just go. Go after Elvis Presley and your Elvis song. Elvis sucks. Yeah. yeah. And John Wayne. And John Wayne. <laughs> um, yeah. You're, you're declaring war. You're, you're putting a, a mark on your back, but that's what his intention was. And it was very lively social commentary. And he, he embraced that yep. persona. Yeah. But it worked, right? We're still talking about it. Well, and it's like, yeah, it's sort of like a brave bravery thing too. It's like, I'm not gonna, you know, very much like your other pick stand. It's like, we're standing up. We're standing up for ourselves. We're standing up for our people. We're standing up for our communities. And uh, we are going to fight the power. We are going to, like, uh, say we don't like this. We're going we're gonna to refuse to accept this as a societal norm. And it's also fun as hell to listen to. And again, I might have chosen this for a party songs episode, but Give It Up is just an all-time party song, too. It just isn't as heavily laden with... <laughs> Social commentary, and it's not as early. It, it was in 1994, so that's like when hip hop was in full swing. I think and it was one of their other contributions. But yeah, Public Enemy is, I think, a very special group that maybe doesn't get all the notoriety of your Run DMCs or Beastie Boys or you know Dre and Snoop. But 
They were super important. But they wouldn't understand what sampling is without these guys. Like they're the kind of godfathers of that. Yeah, solid. Solid analysis. <laughs> okay. You fucking dicks. Oh, yeah. No, that's great, man. Uh, thank you for bringing in the 90s for us. Russ, your pick is in the 90s. Is that right? Your first one? Yeah, it sure is. It sure is. Jeff gave us a note last week, so I thought I would just follow the note, but apparently I should not have done that because now I'm going to be standing. Guys, listen, out. whatever you do, I'm going to give you a note to do something different. That's the way that I keep you <laughs> on edge. That's the way that I, that is, I stay supreme and I keep you down and keep either one of you from taking over the band. Yeah, listener, in case you were unaware, uh, Jeffro is our resident contrarian, and he really just likes to argue. So um, that's that's where we go every week. Okay. Anyway, so um, <laughs> so so I, I I picked a song based on like a moment that happened to me. Is this about you losing your virginity, dude? <laughs> <laughs> no, God, but, have, how many times do we have to hear that story? It's funny. <laughs> My first song is from 1998 uh, by Lenny Kravitz from the album Five. It is called Fly Away. <laughs> No, that one was a heavy player in my uh, freshman dorm days in 1998 when I discovered what MTV was. Yep. I'm pretty sure anyone who's listening to our pod has heard that song. So like, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but real quick, Lenny won a Grammy for vocals for this. Nice. And then this song was intended to be a B-side, but one of his friends heard it and was like, no, 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 no. You got to go put this on the record. He's like, they're, they're printing the record. He's like, you got to call them and get this on the record. And so he did. And then I feel like it happens a lot where you hear about these artists or these bands who have this breakout song that they weren't ever going to do anything with in the first place. You know, they're like, well, I just wrote the song. What am I going to do with it? And they're like, Oh, now this is the one that bought my house. Okay, cool. Yeah. Quick side note is I have partied at a former Lenny Kravitz house. Speaking of his house, I wouldn't have brought this up unless you mentioned that specifically. But in New Orleans on Decatur Street, he owned a home, sold it to the next owners, and I partied at that house one time. Nice. Was it a nice house? Yes. It looks like a dump from the outside on purpose so that people don't. Try to oh, funny. like break into it, but inside it's like it's one of the coolest looking houses I've ever seen. It's kind of a loft and it just looks like it's out of like New Orleans vampire movie. Interview with a vampire. But it's like more modern vampire. Like vampire chic. Yeah, it's a very sexy house. It had like a kitchen in the back, and then outside of the kitchen, it, like there was like a bar that connected to the kitchen and on the outside of that was just like a motorcycle garage like right in the middle of the french quarter it's it was just so awesome anyway continue on oh i really like the i really like the baseline in this track i love how it starts there's elements of funk there's elements of rock there's all kinds of stuff what is the genre that you've picked for this here yeah it's a rock song. i mean it played on the rock yeah. station yeah my favorite line is i wish that i could fly so very high just like a dragonfly because that's like for me yeah, you know, I just yeah. want to be like a dragonfly, I you guess. You want to be like, well, and so I'm thinking, so you want to get like maybe 15 feet off the ground? Is that, uh, that's that's really high for you? Yeah, and then just annoy the shit out of swimmers. <laughs> <laughs> and then just like bang other dragonflies in the open air in front of everybody. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. That's That was actually Lenny's interpretation of dragonfly <laughs> sex. That is such a tough conversation to have with a with a six year old. Like, what are they? Why is that one attacking that one? Yeah, uh, it's just a it's a dragon they're flight just fight playing. The they're just putting things in each other's butts. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, Russ, about the moment. Yeah, what happened? My junior year of high school, my friend group interacted with uh, this group of seniors. One of my buddies was his brother was a senior, and so it kind of. We intermingled with these guys sometimes, but sexually, we didn't, I don't know if we necessarily, <laughs> we didn't necessarily like each other, but we hung out from time to time. And there was also like a bit of a rivalry that happened, you know, as well. So it was just one of those things, you know, you do in a small town. Yeah. You pull out your penis and you say, which one's bigger? Who can, 
tie it in a knot kind of thing. <laughs> Things along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. Like, and you've been over here and I'll see if mine goes inside. <laughs> well, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's cool. Try that in a small town. <laughs> so I'm 17, right? And I drive, uh, at this point in time, I drive a red firebird. Nice. Hell yeah. Perfect. And, uh, and, uh, and so one day I'm school got out and I'm walking out to my car and there is a huge dick drawn on the back glass of my oh. Firebird, just in like shoe polish. It's a fast back. Yeah. So it's got a lot of. A lot of glass. Yeah, it's got and a lot of window down there. So it's the sizable phallus <laughs> that you're talking about? I mean, it's huge. It's just really. And I'm like, what the fuck? Right. And then, uh, and then like, I'm, you know, I'm just pissed <laughs> immediately. By the way, awesome. <laughs> so funny. And so then, uh, and then I hear a honk. And I look over and uh, there's this old Ford truck <laughs> with three of the seniors, like one of these guys in there. And they're just, they're just laughing their asses off. I just start running after the truck. And so he throw it in reverse, hit the gas and they're driving backwards. And we're in a school parking lot right after school got out. Like there were, I can't believe nobody got into an accident, but we were like, they're going backwards. I'm running after them. I don't know what I'm going to do when I get there, but I'm running after these guys. Anyway, they get to the point in the parking lot where he's able to like kind of stop and turn. And then as he's shifting into gear, I've caught up to him and I, for whatever reason, lunge at the truck as he's taking off. So like my momentum's going toward the truck and the truck's momentum is going kind of perpendicular to me. One hand gets around the edge of the bed and it slices my fingers as the <gasps> truck is going. And then the tailgate hits my right forearm right above my elbow and I spin off and I hit the ground and they take off. They never look back. And I'm like, oh my God, that was fucking terrible. And I stand up and I am all fucked up like my knees fucked up my hand is like bleeding everywhere i've got this huge bump on my elbow and i'm like jesus that was fucking stupid <laughs> so then i'm like okay so i'm i'm walking back to my car and i realized that i had my keys in my hand when the truck hit me anyway my keys are in the bed of the truck no, oh no way <laughs> And I'm like, fuck. So like, I can't drive anywhere. And I'm the only one of my friends who has a car at this point. And there's still a dick on your, yeah, there's still a dick on your car. The dick mobile. <laughs> and there's still a dick on my car. And then uh, one of my buddies is like, I think they were going to the mall and the mall is like walking distance from the high school. I mean, you had to walk across this field and stuff. And like, I'm like, uh, you know, what am I going to do? I got to, I got to get my fucking keys. I don't even have house keys, right? I have nothing. So I walk or hobble, I guess, across this field, whatever. It takes about 10 minutes to get there and get to the mall. And I end up finding these guys in the, in the food court, you know, and I'm bloody and all fucked up. And I'm like, Hey guys, I need my keys they're in the back of the truck. And, uh, and they're like, Jesus, you could just see his face. He was like freaking out. I'm like, it's like, whatever. It's fine. I'm, you know, anyway, so we go, I get my keys, we get in the truck and, uh, and as we're driving back, Lindy Kravitz fly away is playing on the radio. <laughs> And I'm just thinking like, man, like I would love to fly away at this moment. At the end of that month is when they're all having their graduation parties and whatnot. Oh. And we ended up being at the similar graduation party and the guy who's hit me with the truck or whatever, or who I, the truck I jumped on, he, he had gotten a new truck for graduation. And so we had gotten word of that. And so while he was at this party, we went and I got to like draw like no less than a hundred dicks all over his new truck just because and it was awesome and then uh you know and then he walked out and his like his face looked like it was super intense for a second and then just he started laughing and he's like uh payback's yeah. a bitch good guy and then it was like good and dude. then we were cool yeah. and it was fine yeah i was like man it's like you didn't press charges <laughs> on me for <laughs> i assume that they were using some kind of like shaving cream no it's a shoe polish or shoe polish and so you drew with shoe polish too also yeah 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 i mean we're not trying to ruin anything like yeah it, it was it was just he got a brand new truck and there were like a hundred dicks on every bit nice. of glass and like tail lights and headlights like wherever million. you could you know i didn't put it on the paint because i don't i'm sure it's fine on paint but nice i don't, don't want to mess it up quality that is my uh, flyaway story. The Klingon revenge to serve cold. Love it. Do you know I still have an indention on my arm from where the truck hit me? Like no right shit. above my elbow that goes like a, there's like a little dip. Oh man. I didn't break it, but it kind of crushed it a little bit. Wow. 
Yeah, I, I remember that song coming out. I remember it being all over the radio, being all over MTV, just like total request live every day for like six months. So very familiar yeah. with that track. Okay, so if that's 98, what year is the next song you have, Russ? I am jumping up nine years to 2007. Okay. What's our uh, what's our category here? What's our genre? I was doing kind of pop r&b-ish okay but it, it's got some genre shift because it starts off with a, a hip-hop verse and and without further ado r kelly's ignition <laughs> <laughs> uh no i am i am going with rihanna umbrella from good girl gone bad in 07 nice oh man dude that had so many hits that record that's yeah. crazy I heard that like this was on the the top of the charts in the UK uh, when that song came out because uh, they were going through like heavy rains and mass flooding. So for like 10 weeks, it was one of the most requested songs. Oh, yeah. no kidding. That's funny. So the song was written by Christopher Tricky Stewart and Terius the Dream Nash, right? It, the song was originally offered to Britney Spears. And when she turned it down... Uh, they offered it to Mary J. Blige, and what she, she didn't want it. Britney Spears first. Yep, and then they, everyone turned it down, and Rihanna heard it, and then she said, mm-hmm. "This song is mine." And like, I'm gonna fight you if I don't have this song. And they're like, "All right, all right." <laughs> but so, which is kind of awesome. The Ella, Ella, Ella. Yeah. That part, the way that happened was the Dream needed to write a hit, and then uh, Tricky was working on some beats and. He started adding synth to it. The umbrella song started unfolding, and the dream, like inspiration, hit. I guess. And so he's like, "Hey, man, I need to get on the mic right now." And and Tricky was like, "It's not ready." He's like, "I need to get on the mic right now. Like it's fucking coming." And so he goes and he records this demo, and he didn't want the Pro Tools to crash because they were working on an old machine or something, and uh, he didn't have him put on the the reverb effect. So he just like he faked oh. it. The Ella, Ella, uh, Ella, so that he knew where to put it, but it stuck. That's cool. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so that's how it happened. So they make this demo, and they he doesn't change it at all, like the any of the words or anything. It's like all ad-libbed. He's like, no, this is great. This is perfect. This is what I need. And uh, there it was. So anyway, so I think it's kind of cool. That's wild. Five years after the song came out, we had moved to Houston, and I was working for this smaller production company there and there was a dude that used to work next to me he had like these he was a tall guy kind of pretty stout and he had these like beautifully inked arms and kind of long hair and resting dick face Mm. you know like this is a dude that if you saw him at a punk show he's in the middle of the mosh pit and he is like fucking people up for sure you know uh maybe not not to be mean about it let's just say but he owns a mosh pit yeah like i like you know, you don't want to get hit by this guy. Either. He'll knock you the fuck down, but he'll pick you back up and say, go another round. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. We're at this desk and there's maybe, it's a long desk. There's like three or four of us and, and uh, you know, we're all plugged in. We're either editing or if we're doing like Photoshop or After Effects or something, then we're just listening to music. But, you know, there's not a, a whole lot of talking going on for the most part because you have to stay focused and work. Anyway, so I'm working on this project, I remember, and all of a sudden... Danny, he's the guy with the the uh, the sleeves. He just starts mumbling to himself. He's like, blah, 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 blah. So, and I was like, oh, okay, that's weird. And like, and he's going for it. He's kind of getting a little bit more vocal. And I'm like, ooh, okay, I don't know exactly what's going on here. So, so you have Tourette's? Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I had just started there, so I had only been there a little bit. I don't really, I didn't really know what I was, what was getting into. <laughs> Is this where he murders somebody in the office? <laughs> I started scooting over because I'm like, man, if this guy like starts lashing out or something, like I don't want to get hit by him because again, like it's gonna hurt. Like I just like I don't I don't want him to Hulk out on me or something. He's very strong looking, very strong looking. <laughs> he, he was very strong looking. And uh, anyway, so so then like the mumbling stops, and I'm like, okay. And he grabs on to the desk with like both hands like this, like he just like latches onto him, and he just starts kind of like convulsing or something i don't know it's kind of a weird convulsing thing and i'm like whoa what the fuck is going on and like the whole desk is shaking and like at this point everybody's Uh, like looking to see like what is happening here so i'm not the only one who's like (laughs) 
<laughs> like, what are you doing, Danny? You guys seeing this guy right now? Is everybody seeing this? Everybody seeing what's happening right here? So, like, he continues like this convulsing thing, and then he closes his eyes, and I'm like, I'm about to fucking bolt because I'm like, this is just, I don't like, I'm new to Houston, and this is fucking weird. And then, uh, and then he belts out, "When the sun shines, we'll shine together." <laughs> Right, that's part of the chorus, and he's plugged in, or he's got earphones or earbuds or whatever, and he's he breaks out in this hardcore dance, and he's just kind of like, and then sings a whole chorus, and like everybody starts laughing, and it's not so much that we're laughing at him, but kind of like, holy shit! So like, it's a huge tension release. Relieved you're not gonna get murdered. <laughs> yeah, and then I learned that he is not good at remembering rhymes or raps or whatever and so he was trying to do the jay-z thing but that was what the mumbling mm. was in the mm. beginning i was like oh shit okay interesting so that was my introduction to that song i love that song but i i came to it later in life i remember hearing the rihanna stuff in that era and just being like oh god i am not into pop music anymore and and like uh now that i have children now that i have daughters it's yeah. like very high on the list this is clearly a good song yeah, no, it's a it's a great song. I was, you know, I was young and stupid and not very uh, enterprising in my. You were arguing at bars about Wilco. Yeah, I was I was arguing about Wilco, the greatness of Wilco, in that in that same year. So, <laughs> right. so that's where I was musically. But it's funny because another track off of this album is the uh, "Shut Up and Drive" track, which they end up using in the Wreck It Ralph movie. If you guys haven't seen Wreck It Ralph, you should definitely put it on your playlist. Wreck It Ralph, fantastic. And Ralph Breaks the Internet. I love them both. Penelope Sweets, she's a great character. So that song is in this in, in this children's animated film. And it is a song all about, like, about effing. It is a song about, like, you know, take charge and, like, you're in charge and drive me like a whatever, a race car. Shut up and drive kind of thing. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, funny juxtaposition there. Mm. It's everywhere. Sex is everywhere. Sex is everywhere. Even in Disneyland. Say la vie. Okay, well, that's great, man. Uh, 2007. I enjoyed, legitimately enjoyed both of the stories that Russ told. It makes me wish that I had. I feel like we've reversed roles a little bit because of the note, and I blew it. And I was talking <laughs> about the songs and music and like what constitutes what. And I should have been telling the stories. They they were good. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Good job, Russ. Oh, well, thanks. Both of the stories, I was like, what's going to happen? <laughs> like, they, they, there, was, there was an element of uncertainty in each story, and I was, I was actually waiting to find out what happens. So, good work. Old reliable Russ. He spins a good yarn. That's for certain. That's for certain. I'm just not fluent in the spoken word is the problem. <laughs> I, thought, I thought they came off quite nice, you know? Yeah. Anyway, Dave, what's the final yeah. genre that we're listening to? Uh, so this is uh, kind of a blues track, and it's uh, it's actually released in 2020 by uh, the artist known as Swamp Dog. And the track we're going to hear tonight is Don't Take Her, She's All I've Got, off the 2020 record, Sorry You Couldn't Make It. This song was actually written in 1970 by Jerry Williams Jr. and Gary U.S. Bonds. Uh, Gary U.S. Bonds got his name as U.S. Bonds because his producer was like, if we make you your name U.S. Bonds, then DJs will maybe like confuse it with a PSA about people buying U.S. Bonds, and they'll, they'll be more likely to play it during the, the radio shows or whatnot. So No way. Yeah, yeah. Real story. <laughs> real story That's fucking stupid and kind of funny but then like it was so confusing they <laughs> that he he ended up going by gary parentheses u.s bonds and then they on the third album they they dropped the the parentheses and and gary bon, u.s bonds actually did a european tour in 1963 that the beatles opened for him so that's like an interesting anecdote it was written in 1970 and then recorded by two different artists in 1971. Freddie North did a U.S. pop version, which uh, made it to the top 40. And then uh, Johnny Paycheck did a country version that went uh, to number two in that same year. So, Which is awesome. In the 70s, Jerry Williams Jr. adopted the pseudonym of Swamp Dog to do a more eclectic uh, 
type of music. He wanted to move into more psych rock stuff. He wanted to do more soul R&B compilations. And this new sound he, he put out on his 1970 record, Total Destruction to Your Mind. He was doing acid and kind of really getting into that whole scene. Yeah, but, uh, you know, later in the 80s, he would work with Alonzo Williams to develop the World Class Wrecking Crew, which then would go on to produce Dr. Dre records. And uh, Jerry Williams... AKA Swamp Dog is still making music today. He did a record in uh in 2018 called Love Loss and Autotune where he like uses autotune to make soul music. It's pretty pretty fantastic. Nice. And uh and this record Sorry You Couldn't Make It came out in 2020. It was the first record that I was exposed to with it. Do you have an age on him? Yeah, he's like 81. He's 81 just like Sly Stone. They're both 81. I was going to say it sounds I was thinking like lots of acid, old as fuck. Yeah. Dude, both of these and, like, guys music. do acid. Do acid, you yeah. live longer. Your brain goes, you know, it turns your brain on in spots. It stops all the bad stuff from happening to your body, and you live. Don't listen to Jeffro. <laughs> we are not medical professionals. So recently, he's been doing collaborations with like Jenny Lewis and uh, Justin Vernon from uh, from his like cry songs or whatever. Bon Iver? Um, is that who that is? Yeah, Bon Iver. That's right. Yeah, it is. So he's been doing songs with Justin Vernon from Bon Iver and Jerry, Jenny Lewis. And uh, so he's just, he keeps evolving his music and keeps growing in style and, and, but still keeping that kind of soul uh, blues roots part of it. So, and he insists that Snoop Dogg took the double D O double G from him. Oh yeah. Yeah. I believe it. Well, his name definitely predates it. Yeah. It definitely does. And he was, you know, a founding father of the Wrecking Crew. So, like, Snoop Dogg then would come through and meet Swamp Dogg, and then Swamp like, Snoop. Yo, play you know, what's hey. up? You know what I like? I like those double Gs. Please. Yep. Give me those double Gs, fresh. please. Oh, yes. Double O Gs. Deal double G Y D O double G C. Give me those double Gs for Ds in your Ts. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a remake of High Fidelity that uh, is that classic John Cusick movie. The uh, character of Rob, a.k.a. Robin, in this version is played by uh, Lenny Kravitz's daughter, Zoe Kravitz, uh, who is also the daughter of Lisa Bonet, who was in the uh, John Cusick movie. Cusick? Cusick? What are we saying? Cusack. Cusack. Cusack? Cusack. 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 John, John Cusack. Cusack. Got it. Hard Got it. sack. Mr. Knows everything. Hard sack. Hard sack. So uh, it's a pretty great show. I thought they did a nice job with it, kind of reimagining the story from a different perspective. And and there's that scene in, in the movie uh, where uh, Rob, the store owner, John Cusack, says, I will now sell five copies of the beta band. And he puts on the Dry the Rain track. And in the show... Zoe Kravitz's Rob says, I'll now sell five copies of Swamp Dog. And then she puts on a song from that uh, Love Loss and an autotune record. And I was like, oh, shit. OK, I don't know who this is. I got to figure out who this is. And so I had to go down a deep dive and figure all this stuff out about who Swamp Dog was. And it's, you know, it's really great. They had a new record that just came out at the end of May that uh, is a, a bluegrass record, and it's actually on John Prine's label, um, Oh Boy Records. And on this record, he actually does a duet with uh, with John Prine, which is like one of the last recordings I think that John Prine did. But yeah, so I got inspired to do that because like there's that moment, that idea of like being a record store owner that always sounded really uh, like a fantasy to me, just kind of like. You have a whole store full of like every album that you could want at your disposal to just listen to at any time. And um, it's something that my wife actually would prefer so we didn't have all of the albums in my house. There's this other element of like being so on top of the music scene and being so educated that like you're going to you're going to play something that somebody's never heard before. And they're going to be so impressed with your selection that they're going to immediately buy five copies. And I always just kind of like thought like just egotistically what a cool thing to be able to possess. Like if you could have that much knowledge or reference on, you know, music or the history of music, you know, not to be as smug as them or whatever, but like uh, just, just having that always sounded like a, a good goal to attain. So, you know, I feel like that has continued to sort of drive me through, you know, finding new music and finding, you know, additional artists and genres and things like that helps keep my eyes open to, 
uh, the ever-changing landscape of the music industry. So uh, I love that track. I think it's a good nice. one. And uh, yeah, I was glad to get to share it with you guys. Yeah, it was good. I liked it. Cool. So we actually got a letter in from a listener um, emailed in, and uh, Alice from Austin emailed to say, hey, guys, I really love the road trip episode. I go out to Marfa a couple of times a year, and that's a long-ass drive, so the playlist always has to be good. White Denim is always on my list. That band is great. Uh, well, shit. Thanks, Alice. I really appreciate that uh, that feedback, those kind words. And, um, and to all of Alice's listener friends, if uh, you have a band you think deserves a little bit of love, go ahead and... Uh, Send us a comment or a message in the uh, Instagram or maybe comment on the YouTube video or you could always just send us an email at sixpixpod at gmail.com. And I uh, I think that's going to do it for us today, guys. Special thanks to Shallon Death Squad for our, our intro music. You guys are the best. Listener, check out that uh, jazz metal from them. They're on Spotify and uh, you can hear their whole record. It's pretty rocking. And you know what? Thanks, listener, for hanging out with us. Uh, we'll see you next time. Until then... Play loud and keep jamming. Six Picks Music Club was produced by Gopher Cureself. Edited by Biggest Dickus. With special thanks to Dixie Wrecked.